Okay, why don't we go ahead and uh, get started. Uh, it's our great pleasure at the uh, American Enterprise Institute to welcome today uh, Ian Duncan Smith, uh, uh, who has had a long association with AEI and been a personal friend of mine for many years. Uh, Ian was first elected to the House of Commons in 1992. I, I had uh, the pleasure of meeting him shortly thereafter through AEI's uh, New Atlantic Initiative, which was a transatlantic effort in the 1990s to uh, assess the growing uh, problems associated with the European Union and the decline of, uh, uh, of NATO over the years. Uh, Ian went on after his uh, first election to be named by William Hague to be uh, Shadow Secretary of State for S Social Security and then later became Shadow Defense Minister and in 2001 uh, became leader of the opposition, leader of the Conservative Party uh, after the party's defeat uh, in the general election. Uh, he was supported by Margaret Thatcher, uh, which shows her continued good judgment. He did some amazing things during his uh, tenure as leader of the opposition. Uh, that was the period, of course, uh, after the, the immediate aftermath of the attack on the United States on 9-11. In fact, I think your, the announcement of your t taking office was deferred for a couple of days because of the, uh, the attack. Uh, despite some feeling within the Conservative Party that uh, the party should oppose Tony Blair's strong support for President Bush's decision to overthrow Saddam Hussein, uh, Ian stood with the United States, and I can just say it's something that uh, those of us who served in the Bush administration will never forget. After he left as uh, leader of the opposition in 2004, he founded the Center for Social Justice, to address policies to uh, concerned with poverty and uh, social breakdown like dysfunctional families and neighborhoods that were being destroyed by crime and alcohol uh, and drug addiction that has performed uh, amazing uh, work in uh, the United Kingdom. Uh, and uh, uh, we're joined today by uh, Philippa Stroud, who's the chief executive. She's actually the Baroness Stroud of Fulham. I just couldn't resist revealing that, although mostly we call her Philippa. Uh, after the uh, 2010 general election, Prime Minister Cameron asked Ian to come into the government as Secretary of State for Work and Pensions, where uh, over the past six years he's engaged in really path-breaking work uh, on welfare reform. And, has led uh, the reformers in this country to call him a hero of wel welfare reform, which is, which is well deserved. Uh, last month, he stunned the political world on both sides of uh, the Atlantic uh, by doing something increasingly rare in politics. He resigned as a matter of principle uh, involving the government's uh, policies in the area for which he was responsible. The consequences of the re resignation continue to reverberate uh, in the United Kingdom, both on domestic issues and on the upcoming referendum on whether Britain will uh, remain in the European Union. I think Theodore Roosevelt would have instantly recognized Ian as a fellow man in the arena, uh, which uh, has its uh, victories and defeats. But as Roosevelt said, his place shall never be with those cold and timid souls who know neither victory nor defeat. It's AEI's and my very great pleasure to introduce Ian Duncan Smith. Uh, John, thank you very much indeed. It's, uh, it is always a pleasure to come to the uh, United States um, and particularly here to address what I think without, uh, without any debate about it uh, is one of the most important think tanks uh, in the conservative world and uh, arguably probably almost one of the most important think tanks of any political philosophy in a sense it's had more effect and more influence uh, on thinking uh, ironically either side of the Atlantic um, and I'm particularly thankful to you John uh, for um, for helping me uh, to be able to get over here and to make this speech um, it's been my view for some time as you know we've had plenty of meetings and discussions generally uh, that uh, uh, you, I think, are one of the clearest and wisest thinkers on so many of the international challenges that are, have been facing uh, our planet uh, and where often inaction uh, seems to be the order of the day. Um, you've never shied from making it very clear uh, that that was the wrong kind of policy. I also want to pay tribute before I begin my remarks uh, to Arthur Brooks and the leadership and vision that he has given the AEI uh, 
his book, I think, The Conservative Heart, and his columns in the New York Times, uh, I think without question, point the way to a better uh, and a more compassionate politics. Now, I wish everyone at the Institute here obviously success in turning the spirit of that book into practical policy ideas that help the people who most need help. Uh, I've had a number of discussions with him, and I must say that uh, uh, it's always a, a good thing to have a meeting of minds. Uh, it's always a surprise to have such a clear meeting of minds uh, across 3,000 miles uh, uh, around the globe, but that is definitely the case, and so much of what he says in that book uh, finds a ready ear and an audience from me, that's for sure. And I think the book's encouragement to think about the people who have little is at the heart of my remarks today. And they're aimed at conservatives. Uh, as so often the case, people think that anyone that speaks about this kind of subject uh, must be talking uh, to a group on the left. Uh, this has been my whole drive for many years now, that it is absolutely the province of the conservatives uh, to be as obsessed about this as anybody, uh, because we are the only ones that ultimately can resolve these kind of problems. But the question really is, uh, in the light of both that book and of my remarks, are we on the right ready to recognize the economic uh, and social benefits uh, of looking after people at the bottom of uh, society? And by looking after, I don't mean the classic uh, feed uh, and forget compassion that involves throwing a few dollars uh, or pounds in their direction. I mean, in essence, respecting to quote Winston Churchill, do we seek to recognize the treasure within every human person and when the treasure remains buried and undiscovered? As conservatives, I think we need to keep asking ourselves, are we doing enough ultimately to build a welfare system that encourages rather than replaces work and the family? Are we encouraging a wage culture that recognizes the better paid employees? Are we as worried about the marginal tax rates that trap people at the bottom as those that disenterize people at the top? And are we devising immigration policies that encourage employment uh, of local people, and I stress that, rather than the ones which encourage corporates uh, to seek cheap labor from abroad as their first resort rather than their last resort? And do we worry nearly as much about the people who never vote at all or rarely vote for us as we worry about other core voters? Only when the answer to all these questions with an emphatic yes will conservatives flourish uh, and deserve to flourish. Only, I believe, when people uh, actually think our hearts are as big as our heads will they stick with us through thick and thin. When they see we are in politics for everyone, we'll be in touch uh, with our historical purpose. And let me just put that in context. In the relationship between our two countries, I think, there are a few more important chapters that illustrate uh, a politics for everyone, then the reaction, I think, uh, a little known, actually, funnily enough, uh, of the Lancashire mill workers when Abraham Lincoln was blockading the Confederacy, southern ports, and denying them uh, in, in Manchester the raw cotton upon which their livelihoods depended. Staggering thought uh, that the uh, scale of the cotton production in Manchester literally dwarfed production everywhere else in the world put together. And so this effect was dramatic on them in not having access to that raw material. It's a historical fact that soup kitchens opened as 60% of Lancashire's mills became shuttered, closed. Egged on by the slave masters in the Confederacy, there were calls for the Royal Navy to break Lincoln's blockade, and more Confederate flags were said to be flying in the port of Liverpool than in the southern state of Virginia. And bear in mind the scale and, and capacity of the Royal Navy had they chosen to do it. And given the Royal Navy's proud record through its West African squadrons in ending the Atlantic slave trade, it would have been perverse if British sailors had attempted to end President Lincoln's blockade. But while many cotton workers and many mill owners had sympathy with the idea, it was not the will of the majority. Despite being urged by the Manchester Guardian to boycott the gathering, a mass meeting was held in Manchester's Free Trade Hall uh, in December 1862, and a motion was passed by, and I quote, the working people of Manchester, and sent to Abraham Lincoln, urging him to continue the blockade, defeat the Confederacy, and so abolish slavery, describing it as, and I quote again, a foul blot on civilization and Christianity. So despite the empty stomachs and the lack of work, 
The people of Lancashire put morality and human solidarity first. So moved by this exceptional act of decency, Lincoln wrote a letter to the working people of Manchester, and in the rich, inspirational prose uh, we all remember uh, him from through his writings, he stated, and I want to quote this because this, I think, explains something very important, particularly in the context of some other debates now taking place. Uh, I cannot but regard your decisive utterances on the question as an instance of sublime Christian heroism which has not been surpassed in any age or in any country. It is indeed an energetic and re-inspiring assurance of the inherent truth and of the ultimate and universal triumph of justice, humanity, and freedom. Whatever misfortune may befall your country or my own, the peace and friendship which now exists between the two nations will be, as it shall be my desire, to make them perpetual. So really, in one profound word, perpetual, Lincoln explained what the special transatlantic relationship was all about. In short, he showed that it is about our shared values, but even more, he explains its fundamental truth about conservative philosophy, and it is this, that there are values greater than just economic self-interest. There has to be in politics a concern for the welfare of everyone, not just for the majority. If our politics does not address the situation of the poorest, the weakest and the most vulnerable, it is a politics that does not deserve <coughs> to prosper. For the last six years in Britain's welfare secretary, I, until my resignation last month, as John kindly described, uh, it's been helping to build, I have certainly through this, a social... Uh, uh, a socially just conservatism. Uh, in an age of austerity, when the Prime Minister, uh, David Cameron, inherited the biggest peacetime deficit in British history, it has not been an easy task. But I wanted to take this opportunity to think about some next steps in building a conservatism uh, that both President Lincoln and Lancashire mill workers might ultimately have been proud of. I do not need to tell you, in the middle of the Trump and Sanders phenomenon, that American politics is not in default mode. Uh, but it is not in default mode in many other places as well. You're not alone. Change driven by anger is evident almost in every corner of the developed and democratic world. Marine Le Pen leads an opinion poll to become the French president in next year's presidential runoff. Uh, the alternative for Deutschland party comes from nothing to 22% in the German regional elections. Spain and Greece can't elect any stable government. It seems that the EU's incredibly harsh treatment of Greece, pour encourager les autres, has only made it worse, beginning to feed this anger across the rest of Europe. And the EU's arbitrary behaviour over migration has only exacerbated working people's concern about their own livelihoods, with the result being uh, that barbed wire goes up all over Europe and countries like Hungary and Poland elect anti-immigration governments. And in my own country, Jeremy Corbyn, you may have heard of Jeremy Corbyn, I uh, sometimes wonder if I have, but in my own country, Jeremy Corbyn, the most rebellious anti-Blairite backbencher of the 1990s, and I know that because even when I was rebellious uh, in my early days, uh, he was always there. Uh, so the most rebellious backbencher of the 1990s and 2000s becomes leader of the Labour Party months after Labour is all but wiped out of all of its Scottish heartland. Uh, and that by the unilateralist, disarming and high-spending Scottish National Party. And away from Europe, Australia has ousted three sitting prime ministers in the middle of their terms in just six years. And just north of here, as you're all aware, I'm sure in a roller coaster of an election campaign, Justin Trudeau soars from a weak third place in the opinion polls and 36 seats to 184 seats and a parliamentary majority and becomes the second in this family to be Canada's Prime Minister. The change that is in the political air is not a freakish event, but I believe a manifestation of the deep-held frustration and anger that those responsible for the crash still appear to be immune from many of the after-effects. In seeking explanations for all of this, I'd first point to the sense that justice was not done when the economy crashed eight years ago. A YouGov poll from six weeks ago asked if the people responsible for the financial turmoil had been properly punished, interesting word. Just 1% thought that they had been, 
I understand, I was checking something the other day, and I see in contrast, seven times as many here think Elvis is still alive. 84% uh, of Americans think that the banks and politicians behind the chaos uh, got away with it. Meanwhile, there is a view that the people who had to shoulder the heaviest lifting were ultimately the poorest. Factor two in our tumultuous global politics, and I'm listing these factors uh, in no particular order of potency. Uh, so factor two is related to the first and captures the sense that there is a class of wealthy people who are protected from adversity, partly because of crony relations with government. Most of the time, we talk about social uh, mobility and needing to involve in a quality of opportunity to rise up through society's ranks. But there must be snakes as well as ladders in a truly meritocratic society. Uh, and that's actually an important point, really, in a sense that is often uh, missed. Capitalism is not free or fair uh, if certain groups in finance, in property, or in some other government-subsidised or union-protecting sector ultimately stay rich, regardless of the conduct they had and rate of success that they undersaw, oversaw. For many years, small businesses were lectured by the banks, and I can remember this time after time as an elected representative. I can remember many small businesses coming to tell me about the response to their difficulties or problems or search for extra investment. So uh, these small businesses were lectured by the banks that there would be consequences if they didn't keep their accounts in good shape. Uh, and uh, they had to meet all their obligations uh, that they had made to the bank on time. Uh, there were heavy penalties if they didn't. And then, of course, the banks failed in the recession, uh, and all of those heavy penalties seemed to disappear. Uh, and the manner and scale of the government's bailing out of the banks couldn't have been more different from how those small businesses had often been treated at the hands of big corporate finance. And factor three uh, is also one that is coming more to the fore, is the automation and technological change that is happening around us. So many manufacturing jobs uh, have already been lost, but the next wave of automation, it is estimated, will replace white-collar jobs at an accelerating rate. Oxford University Research uh, recently estimated uh, that one-third of British jobs, including legal secretaries, accountants, and translators, face some kind of automation or technological replacement by 2035. And fourth is the competition from the emerging world that will become more intense as the population of China, India, and Eastern Europe become more skilled and as the remaining large rural populations of the world, including 1.3 billion Asians and Africans, steadily urbanize and become more direct competitors to workers in advanced nations. And all of these events are happening. The economic crash, the growth of politically connected crony class, automation and globalization at a time when new social forms of media are exacerbating a sense that government and conventional politics are either powerless or corrupt. Some suspect that politicians have grown too close uh, to business interests and key voters. And the result is an, er an era when outsiders ruthlessly tap into this mood of fear and anger and win such unlikely levels of support. As someone who came into politics because I genuinely believed uh, that the likes of Margaret Thatcher and Ronald Reagan and more latterly John Howard were seeking to accomplish uh, something which was really quite uh, special. I can only affirm my belief again in free trade, deregulation, lower marginal tax rates for job creators, and so many other well-known ingredients of that new economic order that characterized uh, the 1980s, and which was largely embraced uh, by the third way. Uh, Left-leaning leaders like Bill Clinton, Tony Blair, Gerhard Schroeder, uh, Jean Chrétien, and uh, Kevin Rudd. But, but the challenges I've listed above are different from those that Thatcher and Reagan saw in the 1970s and to which they devised their solutions. If today they were at the height of their political powers, they would be at the heart of the search for solutions to today's problems. They'd be guided by timeless conservative principles, that the family is the best source of welfare, that a good education is a better poverty defeater than a welfare check, 
that competition is a better way of regulating business than regulation and that government interventions often go wrong and should never be the first resort and that government borrowing is merely postponed taxation and finally that weakness in the face of evil is provocative and that assets and land that are owned by no one are often spoiled. But they wouldn't be prioritizing the same policies that they prioritized when they first came to power. This is a fact that is often overlooked when people reference what happened back in those heady days. And one very important thing, as much as she'd want a renewal of the economic message, which was core, obviously, to her, Margaret Thatcher would know that economics was never even half of conservatism. Conservative parties will flourish electorally when they do other things too. They guard the nation's borders from foreign invaders and from uncontrolled migration. They maintain law and order. They conserve a nation's beauty in a natural sense, its great natural assets and the character of its towns uh, and of its cities. And they are patriotic in the full sense, not just, not just loving the country's great institutions, its flag, its traditions, but also, more importantly, of the people who make up that country. Worrying about every citizen's well-being and their religious, political, uh, and necessary social freedoms. We have to remember, as conservatives on both sides of the Atlantic, that we are the social reforming parties of Lincoln and Eisenhower, of Shaftesbury and Wilberforce and Churchill, as well as the parties of economic rescue and restoration, as provided by Thatcher and Reagan. Without beginning to pretend that every conservative party in every part of the advanced world should have the same program, uh, that would clearly be absurd and a nonsense for a, uh, a philosophy that is in its DNA, a reflection of the individual uh, nations it seeks to serve. I suggest, however, uh, four general priorities for conservatives uh, at this particular time. Every great undertaking needs the equivalent of a map and, of course, a compass. If we are to build a conservative and political agenda that works for people at the bottom as much as people at the top, we need to ensure that we are measuring how economic and social change is affecting every person's well-being. Crude GDP measures are not as good as they were at capturing the extent, I believe, to which every member of society is sharing in economic growth. Uh, they tend to ignore <coughs> how <coughs> they tend to ignore how a disproportionate share of income gains are going to the better off. For example, at the same time, a reliance on income measures ignores how every person is benefiting, in some sense, from cheaper and more sophisticated, more reliable consumer products. The average person is better entertained and enjoys better health care than a king or a queen did only a few decades ago. We need measures in public life the point to all of these dimensions of social progress and social need so that we know who is benefiting from change and then, more importantly, who simply is not. One of the most important components of new conservatism must be the dismantling of crony capitalism, something I know that Speaker Paul Ryan has focused on. And this speaks powerfully to people's sense of fairness. This is a really important word for conservatives, I really genuinely believe, and, and losing that causes real damage to us. So in speaking to people's fairness, whilst we should always celebrate people getting richer through innovation and hard work, we should be worried when people or well-connected businesses like the renewable energy industry simply prosper because of government regulation, subsidies, and connections. In Britain, many have become very wealthy because of planning and house building controls that protect the wealthy of those who already own property and make it very difficult for young families aspiring to get their first uh, foot on the ladder of housing ownership. Boardroom pay bears very little relationship to company performance today in Britain. Uh, America or many other parts of the world uh, are in the same boat as well. As we saw last week in the award, and I don't know if many people noticed it here, the award uh, to BP's chief executive officer and in the subsequent revolt by shareholders at that announcement. What can we do to give company owners more power to control their employees and help them to think in longer-term ways. That massive gap that has developed in the last few years between those uh, employed uh, and those uh, employed on the board uh, has been dramatic. And third, we need to have a positive theory of the state 
we need to embrace a philosophy of strong, focused, good institutions supporting government, rather than, as is too often and glibly produced, a kind of shrink government until it can be drowned in a bath dogma. Government can do constructive work, as American conservatives like uh, Pete Werner and Mike Gerson have argued, in fighting crime or in, in investing in welfare to work programs. We create the conditions in which business flourish and people live happier, more fulfilled lives. And this, for example, is the purpose of the reforms I introduced, such as universal credit now rolling out uh, and the back-to-work programs that we brought in. The purpose of these was to ensure that particularly those who had been out of the labor market for some time were brought back and given the incentive, the opportunity, and the insistence to take up work. Rebuilding their sense of self-worth allows them to rediscover their own talent and the vital role that work plays in every household. The result even now, I think, is remarkable with the UK having the highest proportion of those living in social housing in work since records began. And the proportion of people in work in the UK is also at the highest since records began, and the proportion of women in work is at the highest since records began. And the point I was making, I think, John, over to you, I may be quite slightly wrong, but I think this is correct, the proportion of women in work in the UK is now higher than the total proportion of people in work in the USA. Too often, though, conservatives uh, use rather harsh rhetoric that seems to be all about cutting the supply of government services upon which many people depend. It would be better and more uh, uh, sustainable if we looked first at cutting the demand for government and whether there are pro-entrepreneur, pro-family, pro-philanthropy policies that can help to do just that. Good and well-run government is ultimately smaller government but it is government that leaves no one behind. Let me exemplify this. Through social reform, which changes and improves lives, we reduce dependency on government, and in so doing, the scale and reach of that government. And this is most evident in how we support the family. The family is the best provider of welfare, the best school, the best caregiver, the best springboard and refuge, the best way of converting self-interest into the common good, a young person who marries, becomes a parent, or joins a community is suddenly much more interested in the safety, health, and prosperity of those close to him and others in the wider community. It's why uh, we had that University of San Diego research last week on the huge social benefits of marriage. Rather than being an afterthought in our policy making, which is too often the case, a lot of words but not much action, protecting marriage and the family needs to become central do tax and welfare policies encourage people to live apart or to stay together? Do couples have access to housing that allows them to live near their extended families if they want to? And do we follow through when families get into difficulty uh, and seek uh, support uh, from third parties such as uh, agencies? And fourthly, I would recommend a bias to the low paid in our immigration and tax policies. I've been very impressed by the writings of Reham Salem and Ross Dutat and their Sam's Club Republicanism. Recently, I understand, Mr. Salam has advocated a pay-as-your-own-way uh, pay, immigration system involving welcoming immigrants who are economically self-sufficient and who can help finance social programs for poor Americans, whether native or foreign-born of every racial and ethnic group, and rather than relying on those social programs themselves, which is an important feature. During a period when the economy is sluggish, when life is toughest at the bottom and when most tax cuts do not meet, in a sense, Arthur Laffer's test of paying for themselves, our priorities need to be somewhat different. So in summary, we have economic, political and social challenges ahead of us as Conservatives. In the economic front, our task as Conservatives is to agree with the left that the current economic status quo is unacceptable. But unlike the left, and this is really important, unlike the left, our aim must be to make capitalism more competitive, to make enterprise freer, uh, to prefer market competition to that heavy hand of state regulation, and to worry not just about unemployment, but uh, employment too. Too often the debate centers around the level of unemployment. In truth, it's more important that it centers around the level of employment. 
Uh, and that is the case uh, in the UK as well as it is uh, here in the USA. And one of the policy drives we have emphasized in Britain that I think America might learn from is to worry about inactivity as much as unemployment. People should not be allowed to drift uh, from employment uh, onto sickness benefits and then, as they have done in here, I gather, uh, onto food stamps. And on the political democratic front, we need to ensure that there is a power in the vote. That when people go to the ballot box, they enjoy a realistic chance of getting rid of policies and politicians uh, that hurt them. When power is centralized, bureaucratized, donorized, or taken over by activist judges, democracy becomes weaker. In Britain in June, uh, we will hold a referendum on whether to end the power of the European Union's supranational bureaucrats, judges, and central bankers that they now have over us. Personally, I want to have Britain completely free of the political philosophy that thought that the Eurozone was a good idea and which inflicted such terrible unemployment and austerity across southern Europe. In America, I see much to admire in Speaker Ryan's ambitions to devolve power to the states, especially in poverty-fighting policies. And then, last but far from least, we need to make families and communities stronger. One of the reasons why our current economic challenges are so unsettling to people and why some inequalities are increasing is because we have seen the collapse of too many working class families. From Charles Murray on the right, here at the AEI, to Bob Putnam on the left, the social and uh, relational roots of economic hardship are moving to the center stage and debate, and I believe not a moment too soon. I'm sure that the links between Britain uh, and this country are well known in this audience, and I hope well loved, as they certainly are for me. They go beyond party politics or party philosophy. They're stronger regardless of uh, who occupies uh, 1600 Pennsylvania Avenue or 10 Downing Street. They were strong because of our hunger for freedom, our common language, a tradition of common law rather than acquired rights, the Judeo-Christian moral traditions, great democratic institutions, historical shared endeavors, notably the hot war against uh, Nazism and the cold war against communism. And today, extraordinarily successful cooperation between our intelligence agencies in the confronting of Islamism and, of course, our belief, fundamental belief, in free enterprise and the proven way of lifting hundreds of millions of people in every corner of the planet out of poverty and, just as importantly, out of ignorance. That, in truth, is the special relationship. And in conclusion, then, let us ensure that, as conservatives, we are never ignorant about the fullness of our philosophy. We stand on the shoulders of great social reformers. We stand on the shoulders of Edmund Burke and his understanding that because of people-sized small platoons, it is free society rather than the state that most builds community and protects us from tyranny. We stand on the shoulders of Adam Smith, who simultaneously celebrated the invisible hand of competitive business, but also warned as is often forgotten, against the tendencies of businesses to conspire against the public good if ever given too much license. There is a belief at the heart of conservatism in both humankind's potential to be good neighbors and wealth creators, but also, with too much power, the tendency for harm to be done. Historically, People see the left as meaning well, even if their policies don't always add up or their competence to deliver them is often in doubt. It's just one of those peculiar facets. Uh, but with conservatives, the trouble is it's different. They often, even grudgingly out there, admit that there may be common sense in conservative policies, but become concerned too often about the motive behind them. No one wants to believe that they did better because someone else did worse. And this is why it is vital for conservatives on both sides of the Atlantic to ensure that social reform goes hand in hand with the commitment to fair economic reform. For conservatives, I believe, to earn the right to govern, people beyond the political class need to be able to say, you know what? They're good for me, 
but they're also good for my neighbour. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ian. Uh, he is happy to uh, answer questions on whatever, and I'll let him uh, handle it. If I could just ask that you identify yourselves for his benefit and for the benefit of everybody who's watching uh, the live stream. Thank you. Should we start at the front and move around to the back? Yeah. Thank you very much. It is very, very thoughtful about the social problem. But I think from left or right, Probably those are misleading, or it is not correct description of what they are doing. Our society, social justice is in great danger. The problem now is whether in in UK or in France, the capitalism is a failure. So I just wonder if we can really correct the system problem. First, it probably is those abuse of the power, whether it's the rich or the system, which is in spent to everywhere. So whether we can really prosecute those misconduct and abuse. So whether there's a social program, whether they are trying to, to help the poor, but once the money out, they are robbed by those bad guys. <laughs> so second is the people, when they uh, have I'm problems. I'm sure there's a, there's a question coming here. Yeah, right? that yeah. question is how do, are we going to do it? So that's why I try to tell what we are going to do and what's your opinion. And then the second is uh, once people have a problem, they are shut up, they are silenced up. Everywhere they have no, no way to speak whether you are a candidate or you cannot even have voting rights. And then third is uh, if we can have televised candidate debate for everybody. A lot of time is they don't really give the candidate debates. Like even if a woman voter in the United States is famous for their democracy, but the good candidate, they are obstructed by misleading, by unjust uh, schemes, and they are not supposed to speak. So I just wonder if the quality or appointee, or probably you know why you want to resign, the good quality, they don't want you to serve because they is the opposite to the, uh, those rich people or their bad guys. Objective. So I wonder if we can really say, give you a good opportunity because you are very well qualified. You have a public interest in mind. You know, this is very important issues. So I just wonder if you have ever speaking up in your position to advocate those issues. Well, it's quite a lot there, really. So um, I'm going to, uh, <laughs> I'm going to kind of uh, bring that down a little bit. Uh, first of all, um, I just made the reference in the speech to, um, to Adam Smith, for example. And the point about, this is often forgotten about in, in the construction of the concept of a free market. He made the point about the, 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 the moral purpose of the market was to liberate people at the lowest level to be able to have control and power through their ability to purchase and spend. Uh, but he also made it very clear that it was government's role, if they had any role at all, government had a role to relentlessly pursue uh, any groups that try to collect together against the interest of the individual consumer. And that's a principle that seems to me to run throughout uh, uh, conservative philosophy. And sometimes we drift and have drifted a little bit too much in the past uh, to see uh, the purpose in supporting, you know, big conglomerates and corporates. And there's a tendency to say they're very important for generating wealth and, and jobs, which is true to some degree. But what we've got to be much more vigilant about is not to allow that process to, uh, to damage the power that the free market gives to individuals. And we can see quite recently some of the examples of the debates and rows about some of these big organizations, these big corporates, where exactly do they pay uh, their tax and how do they operate in these countries. And it's, the only observation I make is the public view is very rapidly shifting to this idea that there is a lack of fairness in the way that certain people are treated as opposed to the way that they are treated. And if there's one thing conservatism stands four square in the middle of is that there should be a sense that society is fair. Not everybody is the same, not everybody is imbued with the same talents or the same capabilities. But what we want is they have the same fair opportunity to make the most of their lives. And for those that have fallen behind, the idea is to help them get to the point where they can, can take advantage of those opportunities. Uh, but at the same time, for those 
who are actually engaged in some process to make their life absurdly unfair to regards to everybody else, then you want to damage that and, uh, and stop that. So, so the purpose of government should be clear, and we need to be bold in the pursuit of this, because that is very conservative to ensure that nobody acts in any kind of corrupt way uh, to, um, uh, to change the lives of people at the bottom end for their own goods and their own ends. So that is very much what we're going. I think gentlemen here, and then we'll go around. Just one, two, three, like that. Thank you. My name is David Marsh from an organisation called OMPFIF in London. Um, I agree with a lot of what you said, and I think you put it in a very decent, common-sense, explicable way. One thing I'm a bit puzzled about, and perhaps you could explain this, is that a lot of the values that you and I think myself believe in, I think could be put at risk uh, in the rest of Europe if we were to leave after the 23rd of June. And I'm very worried about the disintegrative forces that you did indeed talk about, and I believe that uh, uh, there will be a lot of disintegration in Europe, including some of our really best partners, like in Germany. You mentioned the AFD. There's a lot going on in Europe at the moment. I think it would be a bad time for us to leave. Would that not put in, in danger those values, that prosperity that you espouse? Uh, well, actually, I don't believe it would, because I think what's going on uh, in the European Union at the moment um, is already there. I mean, your reference to point to things that are happening. Um, you know, this is a a system that was set up ultimately and, and designed uh, by people who wanted to avoid allowing uh, too much uh, power to democratic elected governments to change the direction of travel for the European Union. It's worth just bearing in mind the direction of travel set out in, in the philosophy and subsequent treaties has always been uh, ever closer union to the idea of creating ultimately, you know, you can describe it in any way you like, but it was essentially some kind of overarchingly governed uh, area, uh, in this case the European Union, but you can name it whatever you like. So my, my, my point about this is that that, I believe, has overarching drive and philosophy, has become part of the real problem. Um, and uh, you'll see that uh, two areas that have really affected the European Union very adversely recently, uh, in much part, were manufactured hugely by themselves. The first has been the euro, uh, has been a, an utter disaster for many countries around Europe, locking them into almost perpetual, uh, if not absolute recession, but certainly incredibly low levels of growth to the extent that you now see unemployment in areas uh, around Europe that would have 10 years ago been seen to be shocking uh, and unsustainable. You know, in Spain, I remember looking at it at the peak of this, it was over 60% youth unemployment. You know, I remember going over to Spain to talk to uh, Spanish politicians there and confessing that we had a problem at the height of the recession uh, when we had got to nearly 7 or 8% unemployment uh, and we were looking at around 18 or 19% youth, official youth unemployment. Uh, and they just laughed and said, we never got to 8% uh, unemployment, even in the good times. And, uh, you know, youth unemployment was at nearly 60%. And that's all fallen dramatically in the UK, but it hasn't fallen as dramatically elsewhere. So the first thing is the economic policies uh, uh, driven by a political desire to ignore, therefore, what was needed has led to this. And the second thing is the migration crisis, which is going on and creating massive shockwaves through Europe. Again, you know, here is a system that uh, talks about absolute freedom of movement internally to all these countries, but you'll see the same countries that politically subscribe to that then turn around and actually put up barbed wire to stop people moving from A to B. Uh, and this is the problem. The problem is that when faced by a crisis like that, the European Union itself doesn't seem to want to find any particular solution uh, because they can't question the very political direction that they have bound themselves to. So what effect is the UK leaving? Well, the reality is that you're not going to tug the UK off into the mid-Atlantic somewhere uh, and it just disappears altogether. There will be a relationship between the European Union, as it is, uh, and the UK. Uh, that's a fact of life. And that relationship will need to be thrashed out pretty quickly, and I'm sure it will be, because it's in the best interest of both parties to ensure that. But having said that, you know, the idea that the UK is sticking around is somehow going to change the direction of travel. You know, I have been in po uh, um, politics now 23, nearly 24 years, um, and I've been promised that process 
for 24 years that the UK, of course, is incredibly uh, uh, good about changing the direction of the European Union. But the direction of the European Union hasn't changed a jot. Uh, we've gone from the ERM to the Euro. We've gone to ever greater centralization. We've had four or five treaties uh, with huge levels of qualified majority voting that have driven the ratchet ever tighter and with less power for individual nations to say, hold on a second, this is going in the wrong direction. So I think the best thing the UK can do is to vote to leave. And that vote immediately makes, I think, the European Union sit carefully down and think very much about where they're going and what they're about. And maybe there is a better way for them to be. If we don't and we stay, then the answer is everyone in Europe goes, oh, that's OK then. Then there's not much wrong with it. And there's an awful lot wrong with it right now that needs to change. Ambassador Bolton's Twitter uh, notifications that name, get it squared away. So the question I have has to do with manufacturing jobs in the U.S. NAFTA, you know, years ago in the uh, 90s, you know, I thought that was great. And then the um, cases being made that all these auto industries, I'm talking about car factories into China and Mexico and Walmart, uh, many of their things they sell that benefit, you know, people are made in China. Um, so the case is being made that NAFTA was bad and that we need to bring back these manufacturing jobs that affect so many other jobs. And that's what I wanted to ask you about. Uh, oh, sir, also I'm uh, Mason Young. Um, I'm in the satellite uh, business and cybersecurity mainly working with the U.S. Gover or government, I should say. Uh, okay, the, um, let's just look at that for a second. The, the issue around manufacturing, the, the, there's actually a good example of what can happen, and then there are an, a lot of bad examples in a developed economy. I mean, I spent a lot of time discussing with uh, a lot of the Germans that were involved in the Hartz reforms over the problems that Germany had after unification and the changes they made. Uh, they took a view then... Uh, that investing massively in, in uh, improving productivity in some of those key uh, automotive and manufacturing areas uh, was, uh, was critical. And what you saw thereafter is that, uh, you know, companies that we all know the names of today uh, went from difficulty now to being incredibly competitive, so much so that wherever you go, you see companies with cars like BMW and Mercedes and Volkswagens, I know the Volkswagen problem, etc., <laughs> with other bits, but generally, you know, and they've competed, therefore, with countries that produce at a lower cost, uh, but they, because of their, their, their investment in productivity, they've actually managed to compete with that. And that, in one sense, offers the lesson uh, to uh, the cheaper cost of labor is, is businesses and governments being helped to invest massively in upskilling and uh, improving the productivity of organizations in manufacturing. Now, I think that in the UK we're seeing uh, a significant change as a result of that. You know, some of the car manufacturing in the UK now, a lot of it started with Japanese uh, businesses coming in, but they now manufacture huge numbers of cars in the UK and export them to the rest of the world, a thing 15 years ago you would have thought would have been unheard of. We are now net exporters of cars in the UK uh, because of the, the way that those, that productivity has been driven. So I, I'm not a believer that says, you know, it's just a feature of cheaper labor. I, I think that far-sighted governments and far-sighted employers that invest in massively upskilling the workforce uh, and improving their conditions and at the same time improving the nature of how they produce things does actually keep industries in countries like mine and, and the USA, et cetera, uh, actually competitive not in every regard, for the very, very low level bottom end of the market, then that I can see is affected. But for what I call value added products, there's absolutely no reason why uh, that shouldn't allow uh, and continue to prosper in manufacturing actually to be able to produce and compete with lots of other countries around the world. And I think you'll see that happen where it happens successfully, and I've just given you a couple of examples. It's been remarkably successful. Um, sorry, who have we got? Hand to the back. Uh, look, Guy Bentley from the Daily Caller News Foundation. Um, yesterday or the day before, Boris Johnson, your um, fellow Brexiteer, uh, said um, President Obama was a hypocrite for advocating Britain remaining within the European Union and Britain ceding amounts of sovereignty that the US uh, would never dream of. 
Um, do you agree with Boris's assessment? And what more generally, what do you think of the president's uh, very explicit intervention into the Brexit debate? And if I may ask the same question of uh, Ambassador Bolton. OK. Well, let me first of all say he's, he actually said the, uh, should such an intervention take place, I don't think it's taken yet, although there has been indications from the State Department and others I know that there is a particular view prevailing. Uh, but he said it would be hypocritical whether he was accusing uh, an individual of being hypocrites or nothing altogether, but he certainly said hypocritical. And the reason he said that is because, of course, he was simply looking at the United States and saying that, look, um, it's inconceivable that the President of the United States uh, would be asking to do exactly the same uh, for the USA as now appears to be the case or might be the case for him to advise the UK <clears throat> to do with regards to the European Union, which is to be part of some organization <clears throat> with overarching authority uh, on a legal basis, which over, over, overrides your own, uh, your own lawmaking powers in, in, in you know, the democratically elected government. So um, his point is that it would be wrong. So I have a simple response, which is this. On June the 23rd, I think that the British people uh, will be advised to vote to get Britain to look a little bit more like the United States and a lot less like it does at the moment with regards to the power of the European Union. So if that was the case, I don't quite understand why any American president would want Britain to be any other way, uh, unless, of course, they want the United States to join the European Union too, which um, is interesting, but I haven't seen that advised. Maybe that is the subtext of the, uh, the speech or comments about to be made. But all I would say in the absence of that, then my question is very simple. Why shouldn't we be free, uh, run by our own laws, uh, ultimately through an elected, democratically controlled government uh, that is, that is uh, responsible to the people that elected it? Seems to me like a reasonable place to be. John, you want to say anything? <laughs> well, look, this is Ian's speech, not mine, but uh, I wrote an op-ed in the Daily Telegraph in London some weeks back where I uh, supported the, the decision of the voters, if that's what they do, to exit the European Union. And I said, uh, you should try independence. We have. It's good for you. Yes. <laughs> 24 of June will henceforth be Independence Day, should we be so successful, yep. Uh, okay, so I have a gentleman at the back there, and then I'll come to you. Thanks. Uh, hi, uh, Matty Macron from the International Energy Partnership. Well, first, as a young Tory, it's always a pleasure to hear you speak, and we have to say, with my friends, we always admired your wisdom and statesmanship. So I had a question, regardless of the whole rhetoric around Europe and the referendum coming up, when you resigned, you had very clear words on saying how the current administration, sorry, cabinet is hammering on the poor, on the disabled. But for the last six years, you have spearheaded most of the welfare reforms that, as you said in your speech, actually produced very tangible results. What has, and it's a genuine question, what has changed since the re-election in May 2015 that has prompted you to uh, take the stance? Well, the, the point that I made, I think, when I was asked about this was that I said that uh, I've been proud to be part of a process in a government uh, in the last five or six years that set out with a very clear agenda for reforming welfare, and many of those programs have gone through, and many of them, as I was referring to in the speech, actually have shown uh, demonstrable change because they're changing people's lives and then improving their lives. My concern was, progressively over the last 12 months, uh, we had narrowed our focus more and more on financial savings coming from a small area called working age. And my comment was, if you just look for the money from that area, uh, then what happens progressively is they bear a greater and greater share of the burden in a period when you're looking to get yourself out of a deficit. And I said that I think that it becomes uh, intolerable after a while that that should continue on the basis that others are therefore excluded from this same process. My point is there needs to be a wider sense <clears throat> across the economy of how you bear the burden of looking to eradicate and quite rightly eradicate a deficit because at the end of the day the people that suffer if there is a deficit and ultimately higher taxes are actually those who are poorest. But you need to bear broader shoulders uh, for that rather than just narrow it down to a group of people called working age uh, welfare groups. And as I said, you know, if you look at the figures, we will have saved in year in 1920 already from that area some 33 billion pounds a year. 
And my point is, there comes a moment when it begins to look unfair and it begins to look like it's just a money-making exercise, <clears throat> money-saving exercise, rather than really genuinely about reform to change lives. The point of my speech today is conservatives believe in reforming lives so that they go on to improve their own lives and improve the lives of others around them. That is a critical message you must keep going and exemplify the whole time. It's not just a case of looking just to make savings from a specific group. We need to have a way out and up as much as we do about trying to reduce the deficit. And that, that I said, I think, on the Ma program was how I characterized it. Uh, gentleman over here. I think. Then, lady. Sorry, I didn't see you. Yes, uh, Wayne Balls uh, from the Balls Company. I remember a uh, quote that President Reagan made when he spoke before the Royal Society of International Affairs upon uh, his uh, returning home from the Moscow summit with uh, uh, Mikhail Gorbachev. He, he quoted Evelyn Wall as saying that uh, one cannot pretend to enjoy the benefits of Western civilization while at the same time uh, failing to acknowledge the basis, uh, the supernatural basis on which those benefits exist. Shouldn't we in both our lands um, uh, take into account our Judeo-Christian values in government and empowering our churches and our synagogues to uh, uh, minister to the social uh, needs of each of our congregations. Uh, wouldn't that uh, wouldn't that improve both our both our lands governments and both our land societies as part of a conservative philosophy? Well, I think it is inherent in conservative philosophy that uh, uh, that we don't see government as um, the arbiter of all support. Far from it. Actually, most support, as I said in the speech comes from what Berkman described as the small platoons. That is to say, you know, the charitable groups, the churches are involved, families, of course, are the core heart of it. So it's revitalizing these structures is critical for the widest reach of support. Governments have a role to play, uh, but it's, you know, what happens sometimes is government becomes the dominant partner and drives out a lot of this action elsewhere, you know, insofar as government has actually affected the nature of families staying together. Uh, because of the way it makes payments, it can be a very blunt instrument. So my point is government needs to measure what it's doing against some very basic tenets. Do families stay together uh, if this is the case, or are they made more difficult to stay together? <clears throat> is it cheaper to be apart than it, you know, than it is to be together? These are questions that you need to measure against government activity. And if the answer is it damages the structures of you know, the, 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 the charities and the community groups, uh, and the families, and the answer is you should not be in that area, you should be pulling back from it and, in, and incentivizing activity elsewhere. So it's a balance between the two. Lady over here. Yeah, why don't we make this the last one, if that's okay. Thank you. Hello. Um, my name is Jen Bates. I'm very happy to say that I'm a citizen both of the US and the UK. Um, my question is uh, for you, Mr. Duncan Smith. Um, what is the most important thing for a conservative government, a conservative with a small c, I must, I must add, to do to improve the lot of the poorest citizens? What, what is the most important thing? Well, in some senses, I, <clears throat> I've touched on this uh, heavily in the speech. Uh, the purpose of conservative government is to recognize uh, that um, uh, people as individuals have innate talents and skills and to ensure that the system that supports them actually encourages that process for them to rise beyond the situation that they're in. In other words, give them that opportunity. Uh, and I believe some of the reforms we've been bringing through have done that most of all. Rather than just seeing them quite often as a kind of mass of people who need a blanket of support, we actually should recognize that each of them has their own issues, their problems, but also their own skills and capabilities. And it's finding uh, systems that support you know, community groups, charities, and organizations like that that's important, but has a philosophy that says you start from the root of how you build people and then allow them to rise through that process. And the point I made earlier on about uh, more people in social housing now in work than ever before, you know, we wouldn't have been thanked for that four years ago, but now those families in work we're suddenly discovering uh, what comes with that sense of self-worth for them and their families as they grow, they find they can buy their own goods out of what they earned. And I was struck once by a, uh, uh, someone that wrote to me and who said, 
that when I first came in, they said I, uh, uh, I always bought flowers for my mum every week. You know, I loved her, she'd helped me, etc. But I've been out of work for a really significant number of years. Uh, and I've always bought, but notwithstanding that, and life is difficult, I've bought her flowers every week. He said, and when you came in and you started pushing us to do these things, to go back to work or we'd lose our benefits and all the rest of it, he said, I actually hated you for that. And then I, uh, I got an interview, then I got a job, and now I'm earning money. And he said, this week's the first week I've actually bought flowers for my mother that I actually earned. He said, I'm proud of that more than anything I've ever done in my life. I'm proud, actually, that I bought flowers today with money that I earned. Uh, and it just a little thank you. Now, well, I'm not saying it's about me thanking. It's what happened to that individual was that it wasn't government that helped them through their money to be better. It was they discovered suddenly that actually their life is worth far more than we had condemned them to for so long. And then suddenly they will now change lives all around them. And that is, I think, the most important feature of what we're trying to do. Well, thank, thank you very much, Ian. Thanks for coming here. Thanks to all of you. It's a, it's a great, great contribution to our debate, and we appreciate your coming across the Atlantic for it. Thanks to the audience for coming. Thanks for everybody for watching over the live stream, and uh, that will conclude our proceedings. Thanks again.